So let's go to uh, let's go to NAFTA. Let's check it. Let's see what's going on. We're going to go to CNN here first because they have, they have a little summary. And so here's what's going on. So there's a new NAFTA out there because uh, and they're calling it the USMCA because uh, here's the analogy I like to make. You know, when I was a little kid, um, maybe not a little kid, but when I was younger, when I was like 11, 12, whatever, I played in garage bands and uh, there would be other young uh, preteens and whatnot that also played in garage bands. And as you would expect, most of us weren't very good. You know, we, we were still learning our instruments. Uh, we weren't good at our instruments alone, let alone being in a band. Uh, we also were not all that emotionally mature yet. And being in a band requires uh, a certain amount of emotional maturity. And, and so anyway, uh, a lot of us were not very great. Um, you know, eventually we were able to stumble through, you know, my band was a punk rock band that kind of helps. Uh, our music was not all that complicated. Um, and it was fun and fast and, and we had a good time. It, it taught me a lot about hard work. It really did because, uh, to practice, we would have to go to whichever parent's house was not sick of us. Um, uh, which was either my parents' basement or our drummer's garage and, um, Whichever parent gave us permission, that was where we had to practice. Whichever one was like, okay, fine, we're going to be out for a while, so, so just have your dumb practice. Um, now, getting our equipment there, we were on our own. So we would haul drum sets and PA systems in wagons uh, between houses. And I grew up in western Pennsylvania, a very, very hilly place. So we would go up and down hills carrying music equipment in wagons to load it in so we could practice and we were on foot. And it's not like this was like my next door neighbor, but like my, our drummer lived a couple, a couple streets down. Um, so I, you know, I guess it taught me the value of hard work. I'm sure there was probably something more constructive I could have been doing during that time, <laughs> but I had a good time. But anyway, my point for bringing this up is sometimes garage bands were so bad, they would have to change their name. And uh, NAFTA is now called the USMCA. And I'm sure it, there's no coincidence. Oh, they just changed the name. They just changed the name. When it's so bad, you got to change the name. That usually means it's really shitty, right? If it was popular, why just not call it NAFTA Part 2? Because it wasn't popular. Uh, and here's the deal. Well, let's go into this. So there's some people who are saying, hey, it's not the same as NAFTA. It's a little bit better. Well, is it really? Let's dive into it. Let's see what's going on. And by the way, this is happening right now. I mean, right now, there's an impeachment hearing going on. Well, simultaneously, there's bipartisan cooperation for this NAFTA deal that screws over workers. So, and let's look into it. So there's some speculation out, out there about what it does. Here's the five key differences according to CNN. We're going to go through each of these. All right, so after reaching a deal on the final version of the new NAFTA, you can call it the USMCA because, you know, look, guys, it's not Romney care. It's Obamacare. It's not NAFTA. It's the USMCA. It's not an oligarchy. It's a two-party bipartisan marketplace of ideas. Get on board. Anyway. All right. So House Spe Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, there is no question, of course, that this trade agreement is much better than NAFTA. That's what they're saying. OK, so here are the five key differences. Auto manufacturing boost. The USMCA requires 75% of vehicle parts to be made in one of the three countries, up from the current 62.5% rule. Okay. All right. It also requires more vehicle parts be made by workers earning at least $16 an hour, which may provide a boost to manufacturing in the United States where wages are higher than in Mexico. The International Trade Commission report found these changes would add 28,000 jobs in the industry over six years which also leading to a small increase in the price of vehicles that consumers pay. Now, all right. So that percentage went up a little bit. All right, cool. I'll concede there. NAFTA still overall, bad deal for workers. Still exports jobs, takes jobs away. Um, but, you know, this is a little better than the original NAFTA. All right, okay. Now, let's look at this one. They're saying that labor laws have been strengthened. Okay, so so in this, for instance, in the first uh, issue, $16 an hour, all right. But labor law strengthened. Let's look into this. Manufacturing workers have long blamed NAFTA for sending jobs to Mexico, where wages are lower, and it was a priority for Democrats that the USMCA strengthened the enforcement of labor rules, creating a more level playing field for American workers. 
Uh, for the first time, there will be truly there will be enforceable labor standards, including a process uh, that allows for the inspections of factories and facilities that are not living up to their obligations. The deal struck by Democrats provides for an interagency committee that will monitor Mo Mexico's labor reform implementation in compliance with labor obligations and set a benchmarks of labor to meet. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, translation: these labor protections, these overall labor protections, do not apply here in the United States where we demonize unions, where we don't pay living wages. Now, in, in, in these jobs, and again, in the first, for instance, those jobs are going to be paying 16 bucks an hour. Okay. But overall, we still have a huge wage catastrophe in this country. This does not address any of that. Instead, this has the United States uh, overseeing labor practices in Mexico. The United States, a country that totally flubs on labor, and they're going to oversee stuff in Mexico. Doesn't really help anyone in the United States. They're just going to oversee stuff in Mexico. And uh, I'm sure that'll make it oh so much better. So those are really the strength in labor laws do not really apply in the United States. They're saying, they're saying, oh, well, maybe this will help more competitive jobs because the exploitation won't be as thick. Well, I'll believe it when I see it. Because they're just going to enforce it the same way they enforce it here by employing right to work type situations by employing letting the quote unquote market dictate how much a worker can be exploited do you trust the united states to oversee labor practices in any given country i don't they're not doing it well here so and by the way while they're simultaneously we're going to jump over to a different article for a second here while they're simultaneously saying that, oh, labor strengthened in the new NAFTA, labor strengthened in the new NAFTA, even though these quote unquote enforcements just apply to Mexico. Here's what's also going on. Check this out via The Intercept. Nancy Pelosi pushes a bill to pass USMCA, but neglects a bill with broad support to strengthen unions. So simultaneously, there's a bill called the PRO Act, which was pushed uh, by Jay Appel and others. Uh, the PRO Act passed the House Committee on Education and Labor on September 25th on a party line vote. But two months later, Pelosi has still not moved to bring the bill to the House floor, nor has she given any indication that she would. Now, this is a bill that actually strengthens unions here in the United States, here in the U.S. To that, Nancy Pelosi says, ah, no thanks. But to the supposed labor standards for Mexico that the U.S. will be enforcing because they're crushing it here. Oh, that that's something we should applaud and give a big pat on the back. OK, so that second point, eh, not much, not much. Dairy farmers get more market access. OK, the original NAFTA eliminated tariffs on most agricultural products traded among the free countries, Canada. OK, the U.S., MCA will keep those tariffs at zero while further opening up the Canadian market to U.S. dairy, poultry, and eggs. We have a huge problem with factory farming uh, on all counts, so I, I don't really think this is, uh, this is a huge point. We need to totally reinvigorate the way we go about farming in this country. We just do. We need to uh, start relying more on local farming. We need to rely more on uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction. So, yeah. Updating NAFTA for the digital era. Okay, well, NAFTA was a disaster. Who cares if it's updated for the digital era? Okay, now this is an interesting one. Congress keeps control over biologic drugs. Drugs negotiated the removal of, excuse me, drugs. Democrats, um, Democrats negotiated the removal of what would have been new controversial protections for biological drugs. It's according to the article, controversial. They argue it would have hamstrung Congress from being able to legislate on drug pricing issues. So, so here's what was going on here. They're saying that this is going to help make drugs cheaper. That's what they're saying. Um, I don't think it's actually going to make a difference. Now, this clause that Republicans wanted in the bill, of course it was bad, but removing it, I don't think will do much of anything. And here's why. The provision that was removed from the trade deal, this is getting back to the article, would have required the three countries, that's Mexico, Canada, and the U.S., to provide at least 10 years of exclusivity for biologic drugs. And these are, uh, according to the article, complex, costly to make. Now, here's the deal. So they got that removed. It would have said, hey, you get 10 years of exclusivity, which means no one can make generic cheaper drugs, which means big pharma has a stronghold and can dictate the price. Okay. Currently, the U.S. provides 12 years of exclusivity, while Canada provides eight, 
Mexico provides five. So in other words, the U.S. is still going to have even more exclusivity than that 10 years would have been because we currently have 12. The United States currently has 12 years of exclusivity. Now, it's less in Canada and Mexico, but here's the deal. We usually don't get those anyway. In fact, Bernie Sanders had a bill for us to be able to get more drugs from Canada to make that an easier process, and it was stabbed in the back. Who stabbed it in the back? Cory Booker, among others. So usually we are tethered to our domestic drugs, i.e. big pharma. So this thing, I mean, I mean, yeah, it would have made it even worse in Canada and Mexico, sure. But removing it isn't going to change a whole lot, especially here in the United States. So this whole thing that, oh, this is going to make, when they say you, you, i.e. in the United States, when your politicians are telling you this is going to make your drugs more affordable, it probably is not going to make a difference whatsoever. And by the way, when we have things like, okay, so we have a process in the United States, and by we, I'm actually referring to Big Pharma, so I don't know, I shouldn't be saying we there. There's a process called Evergreen. What that is, is that's a process where, uh, say, a, a Big Pharma company makes a drug, they own the patent for however long, they have exclusivity for however many years, depending on how uh, the patent works. What they'll do, they'll then change the drug and alter it a little bit, change the color or something like that. They'll repatent it so they can keep uh, renewing these patents and then it's harder and harder for generics to enter the market because they'll claim another formula and say, well, this is patented so they can't make X, Y, or Z. And that way it's harder for generics to enter the market. And this process, by the way, totally legal in the United States. In other countries, it's outlawed. Totally legal in the United States. So even if something like this were to be in there, this 10 years, where now the United States has two years less and there's two more years in Canada, five more years in Mexico, there's still in the United States, one of the three countries, so many ways around this anyway. And again, it's still currently 12, 8, and 5. So they're patting themselves on the back for this, saying it's going to make a huge deal uh, in your prescription drug costs. It probably won't. Probably won't. And um, also, there was a bill out there that Bernie Sanders put forth that actually Elizabeth Warren was on board with. Is she still on board with this bill? I have no idea because this happened well over a week ago. She could have changed her mind 25 million times between now and then. But at the time... Uh, it was Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. They had a bill out there um, that would have allowed generics to enter the market pretty much immediately. And that bill, you know, of course, is not moving because big pharma really influences our politics on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats alike. So out of all these five key differences that makes this NAFTA bill so much different, I think one of them has a little bit of merit. I think one the, the auto manufacturing boost based on this article. Okay, so more of the vehicles parts will be made in one of the three countries. Okay. That's that's about it. And NAFTA overall was still a disaster. And keep in mind, this is gonna be NAFTA now has quote bipartisan support. So let's think about 2020 now with this bipartisan support of NAFTA. Look. I am from the Rust Belt. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I know a lot of people in that region. And there's a lot of people, and you, and you can go ahead, you can call people deplorable, call them backwards, call them whatever you want. But in reality, something I can tell you from firsthand experience, from talking to people, from traveling the country for years, there's a lot of people out there. They remember what NAFTA did. And that's why they couldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. One of the many reasons why they couldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And are there some people out there in every state in this country that are, you know, just hateful, racist people and likely voted for Trump because of that? Because he was speaking their language? Sure, of course. Totally. But there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people out there who remember what NAFTA did to their lives. And they remember thinking their lives were going to get better under Bill Clinton, and it didn't. They thought their lives were going to get better under George W. Bush. It didn't. They thought their lives were going to get better under Barack Obama, and it didn't. 
and trade deals kept screwing them over, kept leaving their jobs. They can't afford their medicine. They can't send their kids to college. They're stuck. And they're really tired of Washington as usual. So they took a chance on this snake oil salesman, Donald Trump. They took a chance on him. So now you're going to come to these people and say, oh, by the way, we got this bipartisan NAFTA bill, which isn't going to, they're not going to like that in terms of Donald Trump because they didn't like NAFTA. But now they're saying, well, Democrats are fine with it too. So why does it matter? Either I'm going to take another chance on Donald Trump or I'm just going to stay home. And the way to um, win people in that situation over is not to call them names, not to tell them they're deplorable, not, not to call them racist. Not to, you, you get the idea. So now Donald Trump is going to have this bipartisan NAFTA that he's, he's walking into the election season with. This bipartisan NAFTA. And, uh, you know, Pete Townsend said it best, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Meet the new NAFTA, pretty much the same as the old NAFTA. Get your news on with Ron, don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Get your news on with Ron, don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tweet me an article at Ron. We'll go through it together and 